moment to complete that at the end. Uh, now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our speaker tonight, Dr. Bruce Brockstein uh, from North Shore University Health System. Welcome, Dr. Brockstein. Thank you so much for your time this evening. Thank you, uh, Sabina, uh, and thanks to the Cancer Wellness Center for inviting me to speak. Um, and welcome to those who joined in. Thanks for taking out some time from your uh, evening. Um, I see uh, some familiar names in the um, listing of names. So um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to share my uh, screen here. Give me one second to get this set up. Uh, I don't want that. Uh, give me one second. This is uh, showing up not the way I was supposed to. I'm going to just make this smaller and make this bigger because the actual slideshow part's not working. So um, anyway, so uh, again, thank you everybody for coming. The topic uh, that I was uh, uh, invited to speak about was immunotherapy um, and essentially talking about its role in cancer treatment currently and um, where we might be in the future. So that'll be what uh, I'll be covering and feel free to jot down questions. Um, I'm happy to stay on as long uh, as it takes afterwards to, uh, to chat through any uh, uh, questions or topics that come up. Um, I specifically thank Savina for finding this picture. I don't know where she found it, but I saw it. I thought it was actually more likely one of my children uh, than me. Um, but uh, again, I appreciate that, uh, Sabina. Thanks for uh, being judicious with the choice. Um, so these are some of the objectives. We'll discuss the use of immunotherapy uh, in cancer. We'll review what immune checkpoint inhibitors are and how they are used currently in uh, treatment of cancer. We'll talk about the adverse events or side effects and really how they're unique um, in immunotherapy compared to um, other types of treatment. And we'll um, discuss some of the things that are really unique to immunotherapy and treating cancer patients that are different than all the other treatments that we tend to use. And then I'll spend some time talking about what are some of the future directions uh, that we'll be uh, entering in in the immunotherapy uh, arena. So first, just kind of overview of, of cancer. I think everybody on the call is familiar in various aspects, but it sometimes helps to set the stage a little bit. Um, it's actually about 50 years now since uh, uh, President Nixon declared a war on cancer in 1971. We've made a fair amount of progress, a lot of room to go. So fair amount of progress. If you just look at survival rates uh, across the board um, in uh, early 1970, it was about 50% or maybe a little bit more. And we've crossed the 70% uh, cure rate mark for those diagnosed with, uh, with cancers. Um, and that amounts to about 2 million people, almost 2 million people a year with cancer. So about 70% cured, but that still leaves a lot of people uh, who are not surviving cancer. So there's a lot of room to go in research and improving treatments for sure. Um, the impact uh, that 50 to 70% has really kind of uh, happened in these three areas, prevention, early detection, and, uh, and better treatments. Um, so let me just kind of show uh, graphically what we've seen. This is 1930 to 2018, cancer survival rates by, um, by men and women. You see the trend here, cancer rates in men went up for a long time, and a big part of this was due to tobacco and other occupational exposures. Um, 1964, uh, Surgeon General said stop smoking. Uh, tobacco rates went down, and it took 20 or 30 years for that to uh, translate into lower death rates. And you can see a steep decline in death rates or higher survival rates uh, in men compared to before that. And in women, a gradual decline, but again, starting in the late 90s with uh, the advent of some significant changes in, in diagnostics and treatment, that uh, uh, survival rate went up or the death rate went down. Um, and this is by cancer type in men. And again, you can see lung is this red. Uh, it was actually in 1930, it was rare to die of lung cancer, but as tobacco caught up, that happened and then the rates went down. But even in many of the other types of cancer, um, here you see prostate, the rates going down, stomach cancer, there's been steady progress made. And then likewise, um, you see the same trend in women um, with 
uh, here with um, lung cancer and pink is breast cancer and green is colon cancer. So steady uh, decreases. Um, so we've made the impact in prevention, early detection, better treatment. I think it's worth talking about uh, how each of those have come about and what have been the contributors that sets the stage, I think, for talking about immunotherapy. So in terms of prevention, um, there's been some big ones, decreased exposure to carcinogens and tobacco cessation, as I showed on the prior slides, has been a big part of that. Um, uh, and then other uh, exposures, so accidental radiation, uh, workplace regulation of uh, carcinogens, uh, emissions and pollutions that uh, increase um, uh, cancer rates and cancer death rates, and then diet and an understanding of, of diet. Some positive impacts along the way, but some also some negative impacts. Um, certain vaccines uh, maybe don't get enough attention, but vaccines like the uh, human papilloma virus vaccine is going to translate uh, into a significant decrease in death rates for uh, cervical cancer and throat cancer. Um, the hepatitis B vaccine will decrease liver cancer. Uh, that's already starting to happen. Um, by treating pre-malignancy and having a better understanding of pre-malignancy, uh, colonic polyps, polyps, cervical pre-malignancy, uh, skin pre-malignancies, um, by eradicating things like hepatitis C, where cirrhosis that develops can lead to cancer, uh, the rates of cancer development, and therefore cancer deaths have gone down. And uh, public health campaigns have, have played a big role in it and will continue to do so. And then genetic screening has, has had an impact too, in that those people identified with uh, hereditary syndromes can have uh, the opportunity at least to have either accelerated screening or risk-reducing surgeries uh, and treatments. Um, early detection plays a role, so screening. So we routinely screen uh, for breast cancer through mammography, for colorectal cancer, uh, through colonoscopy, uh, cervical cancer with pap smear, uh, prostate cancer with PSA, number of other uh, uh, routine screenings. And those have translated to uh, earlier detection and therefore decrease uh, death rates, improve survival rates. Um, increased access to insurance. There have been studies that showed that even just in the last 10 years through uh, affordable health care, um, uh, there's been uh, better access to care, earlier diagnosis, and therefore improved survival rates. Education and other public health measures have helped to lead to earlier detection as people understand some of the signs and symptoms of cancer. And then in addition to screening, improved diagnostic tests that allow us to uh, consider early screening. And this is not talking about some of the things that are in the future that may have a big impact over the next five to 20 years, uh, like detecting uh, uh, cancerous DNA in the blood from certain uh, uh, blood tests. And then uh, better treatment. Um, and this has had a big impact. I think we'd all like to see, even those of us who spend our day doing treatment, we'd all love to be put out of business and not need to get to the treatment part with better uh, earlier detection and prevention. But the fact is we still have to rely on treatment. And so that's come in a number of forms. That includes uh, improved uh, surgical techniques, um, radiation, uh, techniques and advancements in those fields, and then systemic therapies. So chemotherapy, which you know really got its start in the 1950s and 60s, treating very advanced disease, eventually crept into the earlier stage of disease. And we could think of you know the the uh, place where maybe we think of it in some ways the most. For example, using um, chemotherapy after the treatment for breast cancer or colon cancer, not because the cancer had spread, but because there may be microscopic cancer. And optimizing those treatments has improved uh, uh, cancer cure rates and survival rates significantly. Um, the uh, therapies that developed in the 1990s, the monoclonal antibodies, these are proteins that target uh, certain targets on cancer cells. So rituximab is one example, um, uh, Herceptin, several others. And these have uh, directly led to increased survival rates in certain cancers. The targeted therapies that are pills, uh, and there's a number of them, um, and just for example, Gleevec or Matinib for treating a form of leukemia and a certain sarcoma, uh, these have had direct impacts in, uh, in increasing cure rates and survival rates in certain cancers. And then immunotherapy, which will really be the, the, um, the bulk of what we talk about for the rest of the, uh, the time. 
So what is uh, immunotherapy? Um, so the concept in the big picture, the concept is that immunotherapy uh, consists of a, a cadre of different treatments that basically allow the body to utilize its own immune system to identify cancer and to recognize it and to eradicate it. So um, all day long, our, 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 our bodies and our immune systems are exposed to uh, cells that have gone awry. This happens constantly. And so we eradicate those bad cells so that they don't become cancerous. Uh, but uh, certain um, uh, cells can find a way to um, evade the immune system, which we'll talk about. So that, that's the general concept. There's been really many decades of research into it. It's not a new concept. There's been about 40 years of uh, really uh, discrete research in, um, in immunotherapy. But it's really only been in the last 10 years, since about 2011, that we've made any big impact. And that's with these drugs that we refer to as the checkpoint inhibitors. And ultimately led in 2018 to two, um, two researchers in immunotherapy being awarded the, the Nobel Prize in medicine, which was a, a big deal. So we'll talk a little bit about immunotherapy and to do so, we'll talk a little bit about some of the basic uh, treatments that we use for, for cancer. Um, we talked about, or I mentioned chemotherapy, um, used either for advanced cancers or to try to prevent cancers from becoming advanced. Uh, Androcrine therapy, which is hormonal therapy, which I kind of left out that also has had a big impact um, on reducing um, death rates and increasing survival rates for, for cancer. Um, and then uh, the targeted therapies that I mentioned, which comes in both the intravenous form, which are the monoclonal antibodies and the pills, uh, uh, generally referred to as tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Um, and then immunotherapy, which is really the newest of the systemic therapies. And um, immunotherapy not equal to chemotherapy. And I have to say, I have this slide up here, not only for um, giving this talk here and to uh, more of a patient population, but also to my colleagues, because I think it's really important that, uh, that the health professionals understand the difference between the checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapy drugs and the uh, um, other chemotherapy drugs. It's a big part of, uh, of my role and of, of oncologist's role is to educate our, our colleagues. So again, what is immunotherapy? Um, um, basically, these are uh, the drugs that allow our body's immune cells to recognize uh, cancer cells. So cancer cells can essentially evade the immune system or quote, hide from the immune system talk about how that happens in a bit. And the immunotherapy drugs um, and any of the immunotherapy techniques essentially um, are aimed at allowing the immune system uh, to identify these cells and then to eliminate the cells or eliminate tumors. Um, so the concept or the notion of immunotherapy to treat cancer actually goes back about 100 years. The modern treatment's about 40, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But the immune checkpoint inhibitors uh, in the last 10 years. So where does the concept of using the immune system come from? Well, it actually initiates from what's called autoimmunity. So it was recognized a long time ago that on rare occasions, certain tumors will actually spontaneously regress. Um, one of the places that's seen most commonly is in melanoma, so melanoma skin tumors, where a melanoma may be on the skin, and then later it actually goes away. It's not that common, but it happens. And so a, a brown or black pigmented spot suddenly becomes just an area of vitiligo, of, of loss of pigment. And why did that happen? That happens because the immune system does what it should do, and it finds uh, those cells and it eradicates those, um, those cells. So that's successful uh, autoimmunity. And occasionally there's even um, more impressive autoimmunity. These, these are few and far between, but where established cancers can regress on their own. So that really prompted researchers a long time ago to say, well, why does this happen and what's going on? And is there some way to harness the immune system that does that occasionally spontaneously and direct the immune system to do it? So one of the earlier um, approaches was something called Coley's toxins. And this was named after a surgeon who recognized that occasionally a, a very advanced um, tumor um, would ulcerate, get infected, um, create a very serious infection, but as that infection got better, was treated, sometimes the cancer was smaller or occasionally even went away. So that led some to say, well, wow, we can actually 
use some of these toxins in form of immunotherapy to um, to treat cancers. And ultimately, you know, there were there were reports of that happening, but it wasn't a successful way to do it. You can imagine that that's not the best way to to treat cancer is by creating an infection. So then there are a number of cancer vaccines that work in a lot of different ways, but similar concept to what we do with um, with treating infectious disease. We give um, some amount of cancer, not the actual cell, to try to make the body recognize uh, the cancer as being something that shouldn't be there, um, and then be able to harness the immune system to fight the cancer. And so the generations of the cancer vaccines up till now have largely not been successful. There's really a whole new generation of vaccines that are coming along that may be more successful, but the ones that have been tested in good randomized trials didn't really pan out, but a lot of learnings happened along the way that led still to the modern immunotherapy. Cancer preventative vaccines though, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, have and will be successful. So the HPV vaccine um, is a prime example of it. Uh, it takes about 30 years from HPV infection uh, to cancer, um, at least for throat cancer, less than that for cervical cancer. So we give our 10 and 12 year olds um, HPV vaccines so they don't get cancer when they're 40, 50, and 60. It seems like a long perspective, but you know, 20, 30 years from now, we're gonna see those cancers actually go away as the vaccine vaccination rates go up. Um, and then cytokines, I'm gonna talk about what that is, but these are uh, drugs that are given to help stimulate the immune system. Interleukin-2 has been around for a long time and actually is FDA approved for melanoma and for a while was the only uh, successful treatment for melanoma, interferon similarly. And then cell therapy, as some of you may have heard of uh, TIL, cells, T-I-L, uh, and uh, um, other uh, uh, types of uh, uh, cellular therapies, which we will cover in a bit. So um, this is the part where there's a little bit of biology, a couple of slides. And, and for those of you who really don't want to see this, go you know get, uh, get some food or a drink for a second. But um, I think it's really interesting, and it does help to understand it if you kind of bear with me a little bit. I'll try to uh, keep it relatively simple. So this is actually a, a diagram. You can actually spend hours talking about it, but the basic concept here is that for the immune system to do everything it's supposed to do, whether it's fighting a virus like COVID or bacteria or fighting a cancer cell, it takes a lot of different steps, and that's what's really all demonstrated here. Um, so the 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 foreign substance, the germ or the cancer cell needs to present itself to the immune system in some way. The immune system needs to uh, recognize it. It needs to say, all of us immune system cells need to multiply and be in step to go after this, um, this enemy. Uh, the cells have to get into, in this case, the tumor, they have to find their way into the tumor and then do their killing of the, the cancer cells. And to do this, there's a lot of steps. Uh, but the main thing to concentrate on is that there's, hopefully everybody has a color monitor. <laughs> um, there's the green things and the red things. And the green things are, um, are chemical signals in the body that stimulate the immune system. And the red things dampen the immune system out. So you can imagine when you have an infection, you want your immune system to be ramped up to fight the infection. But you don't want that to happen forever because when that when your immune system gets ramped up, you get a fever of 103, you feel achy, and you're horrible. So at some point, that has to downregulate. So you have your um, stimulatory things, and then you need those that are going to inhibit the immune uh, uh, the immune system. Um, so when everything's in balance, infections are fought well, cancers are fought well. But when they're out of balance, if you have too much red. If cancer cells are finding a way to suppress the immune system, um, then the immune system doesn't work right. So the concept of using immunotherapy then, a lot of it revolved initially around saying, hey, what if we, what if we have all these green molecules, all these chemicals, and we give it in very high doses to try to stimulate the immune system to fight the cancer? So that's the concept of interleukin-2 of interferon, which some people may have heard of because those have been around for a while. So those helped a bit, but two things happened. Number one, uh, people get really sick when you give it. You feel really, really cruddy when you get high dose interleukin-2, and it's actually dangerous. 
And number two, it doesn't work well enough. Just the stimulation doesn't work well enough. So that led some very smart people to say, well, what if instead of just stimulating the immune system, we go after the things that are stopping it? What if we could, what if we could block the things that are stopping it? Um, and that's the concept of the current immunotherapy drugs that are used. And I'm gonna show kind of how that works a little bit more um, in just a minute. So these are the things that become the targets. Number one, um, cancer can evade the immune system, what's called immune subversion, either because the cells that are supposed to be showing these little chemicals on the surface stop showing those little chemicals. That means they're kind of hiding. Um, there can be uh, the cells of the immune system, the ones that regulate the immune response that are saying, hey, everybody, let's dampen this down. And that could be an inappropriate response. Um, there could be things that are blocking the stimulation that's called cytokine immune suppression. But the main thing I wanna talk about is these checkpoints. These are the little uh, signals on cells that tell the immune system to calm down, to quiet down. Um, and when these get upregulated, when there's too much of it, the immune system starts becoming ineffective. So some of the names that'll become important here are CTLA-4, that was the first molecule that actually led to the Nobel Prize, PD-1, and PDL1. And here's just a diagram. Um, and again, I'm just going to try to work through this for a minute for those who are interested in the biological aspects of it, because it is pretty interesting and pretty fascinating. So I'm circling here with my cursor. Hopefully, you can see on the left uh, a cell labeled as a tumor cell. And then this T cell, the blue thing, is the, um, the branch of the immune system or the cells of the immune system. And the tumor cell has these little uh, chemicals coming off of them. Okay, the antigen basically says, hey, I'm a, I'm a tumor cell. Um, and then the PDL1 is the bad thing. What happens is when the PDL1 locks into the PD1 on the T cell, it gets paralyzed. It can't do anything. It's stuck and it can't go after the tumor cell. So the concept of the drug of the immune checkpoint inhibitor is actually pretty simple. It was so simple that I actually didn't think, I thought it was gonna to be too simple to work when I learned about these drugs first. That is you give the, the drug, this little red triangle, okay? That's called an anti-PD-1. You block this PD-1 molecule so that it essentially unlatches from the PD-1 and that allows the T cell to go after the tumor cell. And it turns out it works. <laughs> uh, most of the time when there's a really simple response, a simple solution like that, it turns out that when you give that drug, it has too many side effects. It's nonspecific. There's some route around it. But it turned out that that concept works, uh, not across the board, but for many types of cancer. And that's what we'll talk about. So here's just kind of a little cartoon uh, diagram. Um, this is actually taken from an electron mic microscopic um, uh, simulation what happens. So a T cell countering a, a cancer cell when everything goes right. Um, it identifies it, and then this whole process happened that eventually leads to the uh, cancer cell being engulfed by the T cell and being destroyed. So that's when everything goes right. Okay, so that's the end of the, the biology part. So if you were bored with that, uh, you could come back. Um, uh, this is kind of a timeline of what has happened with, um, with cancer immunotherapy. So 2011, uh, ipilimumab, also called Yervoy, or abbreviated IPI, IPI um, first uh, was approved. And it was approved for melanoma. And I'll show you some uh, slides about that, but that was really revolutionary and changed so much of what we do now. And then three years later came the probably the two workhorses of immunotherapy now, pembrolizumab and nivolumab, uh, which are now used for many, many different types of cancer. And then all these other drugs, I'm not gonna go through all the specific ones, uh, I last updated this slide a couple of years ago, many other drugs in development, a few more that had been approved during that time. Um, and this is a slide I keep adding to every year or so. Um, started with melanoma in 2011, lung cancer in 2014, kidney cancer about that time, and then all of these kind of sequentially so that most, not all cancers, but most um, have at least some indication for the use of immunotherapy drugs. Uh, you'll notice on this list, uh, uh, 
right here, mismatch repair deficient tumors. So that's not even a cancer type, that's not a body part, but I'll talk about what, what that means. Um, and you'll notice triple negative breast cancer. So breast cancer has been one of the slower uh, cancers to find a role for immunotherapy. Although in the last two years, there has been a, a clear role found for some uh, breast cancers for immunotherapy. <clears throat> So now about 15 uh, or more than 15 indications for um, the use of immunotherapy. In 2011, um, it was really only about 1% of patients who were eligible that represented the people with uh, melanoma that had spread. And by 2018, that number was estimated to be in the 40s. It's higher now. Um, what have we achieved or what has it led to? So um, it's led to in certain cancers where probably melanoma is the one that um, has found immunotherapy the most effective. For about 50% of people with far advanced cancers, with metastatic cancers, to be able to have the cancer eradicated and probably be permanently cured. And that's still a much lower number than any of us on the line want, but that number used to be about two or 3%. So uh, in really just a period of months or years, that number went from uh, two or 3% up to close to 50%. <clears throat> and then a number of other cancer where the number approaches 30% to go, again, going from close to 0%. So lung cancer is a good example of that. Um, a few other less common cancers like Merkel cell cancer uh, or squamous cell cancer that spreads from the skin, again, almost at the 50% mark. And then um, interesting recent approvals for triple negative breast cancer. And then what I mentioned as the mismatch repair deficient tumors, um, this is basically tumors that uh, uh, have the inability in a genetic way to repair DNA damage. And we can identify this through so certain um, sophistic sophisticated molecular tests. And those patients, whether that cancer comes from the, the skin, the breast, the colon, the kidney, those patients are uh, eligible for immunotherapy and it works fairly well. So this is just kind of a graph of what's happened at the Kellogg Cancer Center um, uh, over the years in terms of immunotherapy. So on the left is 2012, and the current was uh, end of 2019. I haven't updated it in the last year. But um, on the left is the number of patients treated with these immunotherapy drugs, starting from zero. And two years ago, going up to about 450, it's uh, significantly higher than that now. And then on the right is the number of treatments. So uh, uh, approaching 3,000 back two years ago and now well uh, over that. So it's a big part of what's being done at our cancer center, really in, in, in any uh, cancer center uh, now across, uh, across the country. So um, how do we know that this was working? And so I'm gonna start, I'm gonna show a series of kind of outcome slides. So what's called survival uh, curves. And some people may be familiar with these, some not. So for the first one or two, I'm gonna to try to explain exactly what, uh, what these are all about. <clears throat> so this is the 10 year follow-up or survival curve for the drug ipilimumab or Yervoy for metastatic melanoma. And this was really a proof of the principle that melanoma could be cured with immunotherapy. So in a survival curve on the bottom on what's called the x-axis, you have time. So here you can see months out to 120 months or 10 years. And on the vertical part or the y-axis, we have the percent of patients who are still surviving. Um, again, it's, <clears throat> there's some depressing aspects of it and that the number drops down, but, um, but again, I'm gonna try to explain why this, is, why this was important. Um, so typically, if you look at uh, melanoma prior to this drug, this curve went down and it continued going down until it went to about 2%, as I'm kind of showing with the cursor here, so about 2%. Um, and what happened with, um, with ipilimumab is that those patients who were still alive, as you can see, at about the three-year mark, um, almost all of them survived. So the cancer stopped coming back. If you made it to the three-year mark and the cancer had not come back, actually the two-year mark, if it had not come back, but the three-year mark, if you still survived, um, there was what amounts to really cure, that line goes flat at 20%. Um, so that was really the, the, the proof that, um, that these drugs could be used to cure cancer. It set the bar saying, what can we do to get that higher? But it was the important proof that that was working. Um, this is lung cancer. Um, this is the initial 
Um, and here you see about 18 month follow-up from a study where patients got pembrolizumab, okay, plus chemotherapy, that's the blue line. And when they got these two drugs together, you could see cure, well, survivor rates, they didn't translate to cure yet at that point because it was only 18 months, but survivor rates that were much better than here's chemotherapy. And um, in the red line, these are people who just received chemotherapy. Many of those people who got chemotherapy in this study were later able to get the immunotherapy. So that actually brought that survival number up. So this was astounding because lung cancer survival curves would generally follow well below the red line. Um, so again, a big, big impact on lung cancer, which is our, um, unfortunately, still our most common cancer that we treat. This is just a longer follow-up from that same study going out to 30 months. And now you can see this line starting to flatten out at about the three-year mark again, which is the important marker um, uh, at about the 30% mark, which again, lung cancer, that number used to be uh, pretty close to zero. Um, this is the longer term follow-up of melanoma where the number actually in the top mark, which is the yellow, uh, settles out, I, I didn't update the slide, but that settles out at about 48 or 50%. Um, uh, another slide of, of melanoma using uh, pembrolizumab and showing how that drug is better than ipilimumab. So the second drug that came along was better than the first. Uh, clinical trials, this is really, I think, an important, uh, nice time where I can drive home the point that the only way we advance cancers through clinical trials, minus the clinical trials, we would be right where we were in 1960. Um, so, you know, the red line represents ipilimumab, which was good, but not good enough. The green line compared in a randomized way to the red line to ipilimumab improved that pembrolizumab. The green line is better than ipilimumab, the red line. Um, this is uh, head and neck cancers, cancers of the mouth and throat. And again, this is when these, this uh, disease is very advanced. This is actually uh, a lower bar. The numbers are even better now, but this was the first immunotherapy drug in blue versus chemotherapy for very advanced um, cancers of the head and neck, again, proving the, the point. Um, uh, same here we see with stomach cancer, with gastric cancer. This is all kind of leading to the approvals of these drugs by the FDA. Uh, bladder cancer, again, in blue. Um, and then this is kind of one of the more interesting ones, and I'll just take a minute to explain what we see here. If we concentrate um, on the upper left part of this curve, um, or I'm sorry, make it the upper right. So this is the survival in patients with colorectal cancer, so colon cancer. <clears throat> and on the top curve, these are people who have mismatch repair deficient tumors. Okay, these are the people whose cancers can't repair DNA damage. Uh, based on the genetic status of the, of the tumor. And for these patients, when they um, receive pembrolizumab, um, it has a, a huge impact. Actually, this also is a, uh, there's a, a, a further follow-up from this specific study, but you can see it has a big, big impact so that people who have that status, if, they, if their colon cancer has spread, um, about half of those people will end up with a long-term remission or a cure. And again, that number used to be far, far lower than that. So, um, so bit by bit, bit, impact being made. And then this is um, really, I think, one of the more um, interesting curves that we'll see. This is a study that specifically looked at patients with uh, metastatic melanoma whose uh, cancers had spread to the brain. So in this study, people um, were um, given the combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab, these are the two immunotherapy drugs. Um, and instead of doing the traditional thing, which is giving radiation to the brain or surgery to the brain, because with all of our other drugs, they don't really effectively treat the brain. These patients were treated with the immunotherapy drugs without getting surgery or without getting radiation to the brain. This was based on observations that these drugs seem to work in the brain. And what was um, demonstrated here was this really important finding, okay? And again, if you stick with me on the, on the horizontal axis or the x-axis is time, 27 months. On the y-axis on top is what's called progression-free survival. That means people whose cancer continued to respond in a good way. <clears throat> and what, what this showed is that the blue line is extracranial. That means the tumors that are not inside the brain 
And the orange line is those tumors that are inside the brain. They're responding almost in an identical way. And that had never been seen in any type of cancer before where we could use medicines and actually treat tumors in the brain. So what was learned from this was that if someone has metastatic melanoma and it's in the brain, if the tumors are relatively small and in the brain, we don't have to put them through radiation, which can be helpful but damaging. We don't have to put them through surgery, which can be helpful but damaging. We could give the same immunotherapy drugs and it works just as well inside the brain uh, as outside the brain. So the bottom line is what's called the overall survival curve. And here you can see, it's really about 65% of patients in this situation who are doing just fine two or two and a half years out from uh, starting their treatment. So those are some of the good things, but of course with every good, there's, there's bad, there's side effects. Um, in the big picture, when I talk to my patients about uh, what it's like to get immunotherapy, I explain that generally speaking, if they're in the percentage of people who don't get side effects, which is really about 60 to 80%, that generally they're going to feel like they're not getting any type of cancer treatment. They might get a little minor fatigue. They might get a little bit of itchy skin. But those who don't get um, side effects actually feel fine. Very different than standard chemo, where there might be hair loss or nausea, or low blood counts or diarrhea or some of these other side effects. Um, but the side effects that happen happen when the immune system gets revved up trying to treat the cancer, but also manages to misidentify some of the body parts as something that should be um, uh, inflamed or, or, uh, or treated. So it's called an autoimmune response, meaning your immune system is misidentifying the body as something that um, requires an immune response. And that's the basis of the side effects. So I'm going to talk about that. Um, so essentially what happens is you end up with inflammation from these T cells. Uh, the word itis applies to any of these side effects. Um, so one can think of pneumonitis or nephritis, uh, lung inflammation, kidney infl inflammation. Essentially any organ system can get inflamed. Um, it can happen at any time during treatment, but generally it doesn't start until weeks or months into treatment. Okay. Uh, it can be a little unpredictable. I've had people who were fine for 15 months and then develop uh, side effects. And um, I've had people who develop side effects 10 or 12 days into treatment. But the typical thing is people develop a side effect between the first and the fourth month. Um, some of these side effects can be very dangerous and life-threatening. So the take-home message that I always tell my patients is there's a whole number of things that we could talk about because we could list every body part. But if something's happening and is not right, if there's a change in how you're feeling, then I wanna know about that right away. Let me, let me try to understand if that's happening from the medications or if that's from something else. <clears throat> and, and so this is essentially just basically showing that you could take a body part, uh, apply the word itis to it and, and anything, um, uh, any of those uh, different body parts can become inflamed. This is kind of a uh, verbal listing of it. Uh, so some of the more frequent things that happen and maybe more than 10% of people with certain drugs include um, arthralgia, so that's achiness of the muscles and joints, not necessarily arthritis with inflammation, uh, diarrhea, fatigue, uh, underactive thyroid gland, uh, rash, um, inflamed um, liver tests uh, or hepatitis. And then these are some of the less common side effects that can happen, but some of the ones that are more dangerous. So these are ones we specifically go over with patients. Um, I'll tell people, you know, it's not that common to get, for example, type 1 diabetes, but that actually can happen in uh, up to about 1% of patients going through this treatment. Um, and I'll explain some of those symptoms. Myocarditis, which is inflammation of the lungs, uh, inflammation of the heart, um, is actually quite uncommon, but it can, uh, it, can, it can come on very quickly, and we don't have a very big window of time to treat it. We, treat it. we actually have to identify it very quickly, or it could be dangerous or even fatal. Uh, pneumonitis, which is inflammation of the lungs, which can be very, uh, very serious too. So again, we like to, uh, or I like to tell people about those things that are common, things that they might experience, but also those things that are uncommon, um, but um, that should trigger a, uh, uh, some thoughts. So again, colitis, bad diarrhea, very obvious to patients. Uh, almost always uh, people will give us a call about that. Pneumonitis can be more subtle. People get a little cough. They think it's from something else, but a cough that shouldn't be there you know, something I always want to hear about. 
uh, inflammation of the endocrine system of the hormone producing glands like the thyroid gland and the adrenal, very important, uh, dermatitis, um, uh, skin inflammation, uh, the most common thing, but in the, in the extreme form could be very dangerous than, as I mentioned, myocarditis or heart inflammation. So with the single drugs, the most common drugs we give, which is pembrolizumab, nivolumab, um, atezolizumab, a, a number of those drugs, if you're getting just one of those, about 15 to 20% of people get one of these significant side effects. If we're using the combination of, uh, of the two, of ipilimumab and one of the other drugs, then that number goes up to as much as 50 or 55%. Um, so people getting that combination really have to be uh, aware because the rate is much higher. And then one of the other side effects that we um, pay a lot of attention to um, is financial toxicity. So this is a term that kind of got its, uh, I think it was coined maybe you know 10 years ago or so, uh, but certainly applies to, to these, uh, these drugs. They're enormously uh, expensive um, for a full year of treatment. It ends up being in the range of, you know, two to four hundred thousand dollars, depending on one drug or two drugs. Um, so, uh, making sure we have uh, insurance pre-approval, and when we don't, uh, working with our patient financial advocates to find patients coverage, um, uh, either through a clinical trial or often from the companies that that uh, make the drugs. They've been very good in uh, in helping patients. Um, so what's unique about immunotherapy is, you know, for those of us who trained prior to immunotherapy, the side effects are completely different. And you really have to have an understanding of it in order to successfully treat patients with immunotherapy. And this is just an example of uh, what we have to understand when we're assessing people with inflammation of the lungs. And I don't expect anybody to quite get uh, what's going on here, but if I show you this uh, side here, what I'm circling, that's a somewhat normal looking portion of lung. Um, the classic type of inflammation we would see is right here where we see, I'm circling where it says type two ground glass. And that's where the whole lung is kind of white and inflamed. Um, most radiologists, most oncologists would see that and say, ooh, something is inflamed in the lung. And that's one of the more common ways people get lung inflammation, but it could look many different ways, like it does by this red mark up top, with these small dots here, um, or even like uh, on the left of the screen, where these uh, rounded things that look like tumors can actually be inflammation. So you have to be able to identify it. Um, this is an example where the red arrow is pointing to a nodule in a lung. And this is from a young patient of mine. She was uh, 26 or 25 at the time, and she was doing fine. And we got her routine CT scan uh, screening to make sure everything was good. And um, I got the result of her, her scan. Actually, was uh, out of town at the time at a baseball tournament with one of my sons and was checking my results. And I saw this and it was reported as, as a new metastasis, a tumor that spread and my heart sank. And then I looked closer. And if you really look, the, this, this little nodule is kind of fuzzy around the edges, which is not how a melanoma tumor should be. <clears throat> so we got, got her started very quickly on a steroid, which is the antidote to almost all of these itis things, okay? And once we did that, the nodule went away uh, and stayed away. Um, so the take home point there is recognition of the problem. And then we treat most of these problems with steroids. So I'm gonna show just a few examples of some of the other uh, things that, that show up. These are all from some of my patients. This is an MRI scan of the brain. Uh, from a patient of mine who was on um, uh, immunotherapy for melanoma. She got this MRI scan because she wasn't feeling well. And the radiologist, this was right at the beginning of uh, using these drugs. So again, radiologists still at that point not familiar with a lot of the things. Radiologists reported probable tumor in the pituitary gland. Um, but as an oncologist, I was aware of that as one of the side effects, inflammation of the pituitary gland. And when that happens, the thyroid gland becomes underproductive, the adrenal gland becomes underproductive, and a person who is up and normal and walking and doing fine could be bed bound, unable to get out of bed. So this is uh, what was her situation. She came in essentially uh, unable to walk. Uh, we checked her cortisol level. That's the hormone produced by the adrenal gland. It was essentially zero. Uh, she got a, a dose of prednisone and, and like, you know, Grandpa Joe and Willy Wonka in the chocolate factory. About four hours later, she jumped up out of bed and she was okay. 
Um, this is uh, the inside of, of a colon and a colonoscopy. These white patches are inflammation of the colon from colitis. Yeah, this is from a patient who was uh, suffering from colitis. And again, the treatment here is, um, is steroids, which generally makes it better. Um, sometimes it doesn't, and we have to go to other immune suppressive drugs. This was an interesting situation where a patient of mine came in with a foot drop, meaning his, uh, his foot suddenly, suddenly didn't work. His left foot basically couldn't come back up, but go down, but not up. Um, so that always raises suspicion for uh, cancer spreading to certain places in the body. Um, but uh, uh, he was on immunotherapy drugs. So we checked MRI scans of the, not just the brain, but the spine and we found this little dot in one of the uh, nerves that serves the foot. And it turned out he had inflammation of that specific nerve. So that foot didn't work. And when we put him on uh, a steroid drug, uh, within a few days, the foot was functional again, and he's totally fine. Um, but again, you know, it's recognition of these, these side effects, which makes the treatment of immunotherapy uh, unique. Um, so, so in order to really successfully treat people with immunotherapy, um, and now most oncologists, because almost every uh, type of cancer now has an indication for immunotherapy, most oncologists are now getting on board for understanding this. Um, but it's an issue of, you know, choosing the therapy successful, successfully and managing the side effects successfully, and then educating um, our colleagues because it's really a multidisciplinary effort. And then whenever, net, whenever possible, providing patients with uh, the option uh, or an opportunity to participate in research. But there's some other things that, um, that require expertise. So for example, normally if someone's getting chemotherapy and they have a tumor, which I'm just showing an enlargement, if the chemotherapy is working, that tumor starts to shrink quickly. Um, with immunotherapy, that doesn't necessarily happen. Here's a CAT scan showing in the liver, and this is a normal looking liver here. There were little spots in the liver here. And when this patient went on chemotherapy, it says week 12, these spots got to be very big, okay? That looks like cancer that's getting worse. In fact, it looks like cancer that's progressing very quickly. <clears throat> but that's not always the case. What's happening there is the uh, cells of the immune system are getting into the little tumors causing all this inflammation that looks like tumors. <clears throat> but eventually, as those cells do their work, they begin to shrink the tumors. And now here we see uh, the liver starting to look normal and eventually uh, many months later becoming totally normal. So again, we have to be aware, we have to make our radiologists aware that sometimes a, a scan that looks worse is actually getting better. And that that's flies in the face of how we've always um, assess people who are getting chemotherapy. Um, here's a more graphic example. And again, I apologize for things that are a little bit graphic, but this is a tumor on the skin. This is in, uh, in the elbow here. Um, and this tumor 12 weeks into therapy was bigger, but the, the oncologist didn't give up. And here it was uh, uh, a few months later where it actually completely went away. Uh, same thing in the liver. You can see the circled tumor. It gets bigger and then smaller and smaller. Um, more examples of that in the lung, which uh, I'll kind of skip through. Um, so again, in order to actually pull this off at any institution, and this was especially true early on, we really had to educate our colleagues. So when we started using these drugs a number of years ago, uh, we really went on a, a lecture circuit internally uh, and gave talks to our rheumatology console, uh, colleagues, dermatology, uh, gastroenterology colleagues, and so on. And our radiology colleagues, those in the emergency room, that was actually very important because people would come in, for example, with diarrhea. And if somebody comes in with diarrhea on chemo, you give them some medicines to try to stop the diarrhea. And if they're feeling better, they go home. Uh, that's very different with immunotherapy. That diarrhea is not going to get better unless they go on steroids and sometimes get admitted and go on steroids. Very different treatment approach, requires a lot of uh, education. Um, so these are kind of just some of the interesting stories. Um, you know, there's there's too many to depict now, 10 years in. Um, but this was uh, actually the first patient I think I treated at, at North Shore, a patient of mine with melanoma that had advanced beyond all the surgical and radiation treatments we could give and some of the medical treatments. This is a CAT scan taken through the, the skull with the tumor on the side of the skull. And unfortunately, I didn't really um, capture it all along from beginning to end. But this black mark here was the tumor 
And here was the first time that it shrank. And this was just amazing uh, to us because we just gave this very simple medicine and this tumor was shrinking. And fortunately we could see it and tracked it over two years as it, as it went away and stayed away now for the 10 years. And this was a patient again, shortly after that, who had a tumor in the brain and in the lung. And again, with melanoma, that was something that typically would be not survivable. People would, would only survive a matter of a few months. Um, he had surgery for the brain and then went on the immunotherapy drugs um, and the, the cancers went away. Eventually he got the lung tumor removed and that was actually a, um, a non-viable dead tumor. Uh, and he continues to do fine. Uh, this again is a PET scan and what I show on the bottom, all these white spots are, are tumors. And on the top here is after the immunotherapy uh, and the white spots here are just the normal uh, spots that show up on a PET scan, the heart and the kidneys. Um, this is a happy story of a guy named Ed. He was in Connections Magazine. So he gave us permission to be uh, in that magazine and to be shown in my slideshows. Very nice uh, uh, man who had been treated for melanoma in 2000 nine and his cancer came back in 2013 um, and uh, in a very bad way he actually showed up in a wheelchair uh, with his liver test being about as high as they can be um, we um, managed to get him on immunotherapy uh, uh, really within a day or two and this was his liver again if you haven't seen pet scans i don't expect to understand it but black is bad this should be essentially gray his entire liver was uh, consumed with cancer. And after his three months of immunotherapy, actually everything went away. And he was actually up and out of his wheelchair in about 10 days. And although that was 2013, that actually probably remains the most interesting uh, of cases uh, that uh, I've seen in terms of the rapidity and quickness of the response. Um, uh, his grandson played uh, baseball against my two sons. Uh, so I got to sit with him after his uh, treatment and baseball games in the summer uh, for a couple of years. And that was uh, uh, very uh, fun and rewarding to see. Uh, this is a patient who uh, had been treated for cancer of the throat uh, with surgery, with chemotherapy, with radiation. Uh, cancer came back in 2016. <clears throat> and she really had no options left for, uh, for treatment. Um, she had had a discussion about a hospice and really her only other option was a clinical trial that we had. It was actually unique. We were one of the few sites around to have it. So she enrolled in the clinical trial and got an immunotherapy drug. And her cancer uh, went completely away. And uh, this should say 2021 now, but she continues to do uh, well. And this is her with her treatment team. And this is the uh, CAT scan of the tumor that had been in the throat and that went completely away and stayed away. So again, a happy story, but the take home point there is that without access to that clinical trial, um, she, she wouldn't have had this, uh, this response uh, that was an, at the time an unapproved uh, drug. Uh, this is a woman named Ashlyn, and she had uh, metastatic melanoma. She showed up in 2015 with uh, cancer in the, um, a lump in her leg and in her lymph nodes and uh, in her liver. Uh, she began immunotherapy with uh, drug uh, nivolumab, and that was in June of 2015. So this is a PET scan of the liver. And again, don't have to know too much about it, but this big yellow thing should not be there. That's the cancer. And here it is uh, seven months later, and that cancer still remained in the liver. Um, but the, t the tumors in the lymph nodes went away, and the tumor in the leg went away. So everything was gone except the tumor in the liver. So after a lot of consideration and informed consent, we said, we think you should have that portion of your liver out, which meant removing a big portion of the liver. And that was removed and about 80 or 90% of the tumor was dead, about 10 or 20% was uh, living or viable. Um, but again, with standard chemotherapy, if you remove the liver in that situation, it was likely to show up. But with immunotherapy, if you see a response like that, where the, the tumor is infiltrated with all these cells of the immune system and a little bit is living, that's a very good sign. So the tumor was removed, that was 2016, and her cancer has not come back. This was then actually a picture of her running her first marathon three years later. Uh, took her an incredible amount of training because she had some issues, uh, but she ran that as the first of, I think, what has been six or eight marathons. Uh, this is she and I at a um, 
melanoma run uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and then actually ran my third marathon. Uh, it was the do it yourself marathon during COVID uh, last uh, October. And uh, she was training for another marathon. So she ran uh, 20 miles of uh, my marathon with me to help me uh, uh, finish. Um, so what are some of the uh, challenges and questions ahead? And we're at a good point in that we've made big improvements, but, uh, but, but I, I don't really wanna be talking about 20% and 50% survival rates, even though that's better than the 5% we used to see with some of these very, very advanced cancers, we wanna see that bar going higher and higher. <clears throat> so um, some of the challenges that uh, are ahead are number one, can we predict when immunotherapy would be effective? For example, if it's gonna cure uh, people at a rate of 30 or 40%, well, for the those who it's not going to cure, if it's not gonna help, it's best to concentrate on something else. So we'd like to be able to predict who's gonna benefit. Um, probably the most important is, can we overcome the resistance? Not everybody gets cured, not everybody benefits. What's, what's keeping those cancers resistant to benefit or cure? And how can we actually train the immune system better? So that's where the focus of almost all the research in this field is, is overcoming resistance. Um, it's important to also understand and better treat toxicities because that sometimes limits our ability to treat it. Um, we would love to find a way to get the cost down and decrease financial toxicity. We need to educate practitioners because um, uh, patients wind up in emergency rooms at other hospitals. They end up going to their primary care docs and they have to have an understanding of how to treat these patients. And then we need to maximize our laboratory capabilities so that we could um, do things like predicting toxicities and predicting treatment effect better. So do we have those laboratory capabilities to make some of these predictions? And the answer is yes, some of them are coming along. We can predict who may benefit to some degree based on clinical factors, how are patients doing? We know that people who are bed bound um, uh, with um, uh, severe cancers um, generally don't benefit from immunotherapy. We can look at certain uh, things that we can measure on a tumor something called tumor mutation burden that we can get by sequencing a tumor. We can look at a, a molecule called PDL1. We can look at uh, a molecular factor called microsatellite instability and so on and predict benefit. We can look at other genetic factors or we think we'll be able to look at other genetic factors. And then uh, we can look at some things about the immune cells that exist. And then one of the more fascinating things, which would be a whole lecture, is what's called the microbiome. And I'm just gonna, I'm coming to in the end of uh, the slides here, but I wanna introduce what the microbiome is because you may have heard some things about that and you may continue to hear about that. But our bodies coexist with bacteria and other organisms. The colon, for example, is full of bacteria. Uh, we can't digest food without bacteria. Uh, we can't um, uh, regulate a lot of uh, our bodily functions without these bacteria. They actually serve a function. Uh, occasionally they cause disease, but they serve some important functions. And they interact with the immune system in a really important way. So we're learning that there are really important characteristics of the microbiome, meaning the bacteria in our colon, probably on our skin, maybe our respiratory tract. They're important for fighting disease, uh, avoiding things maybe like diabetes and obesity. Um, and that there are certain factors, we can actually look at the stool of patients who respond to immunotherapy and those who don't and find differences in the bacteria in the colon reflected in the stool. And so that is actually the focus of a lot of research is how can we use the microbiome and train the microbiome or alter the microbiome to help us to, feed, to, uh, uh, to improve immunotherapy. So some of the future directions in immunotherapy then, besides trying to make checkpoint inhibitor betters, checkpoint inhibitors better include um, cellular therapies. So you may have heard of things like CAR T cells, chimeric uh, antigen receptor T cell therapy, TIL cells or tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And basically this is the concept of taking um, cells from a tumor, taking them out of the body, engineering something about them. Uh, and there's a lot of different approaches, putting them back in the body um, so that you enhance the immune system's ability to get rid of that cancer. Um, using immunotherapy drugs together with vaccines, um, with, um, with other cytokines, other stimulants, 
Uh, viral oncolytics, this is injecting basically a virus armed with a gene to help uh, the, the immune system recognize the cancer is being foreign. Giving probiotics, not ready for prime time for sure, but ready for clinical trials to try to alter the microbiome or maybe antibiotics to uh, alter the microbiome. So this is basically on here, this is a condensation of really what amounts to hundreds of clinical trials that are uh, uh, going on right now. Um, so with that, I will end and uh, be happy to take any uh, questions from the uh, audience. Thank you so much, Dr. Brockstein. A couple did come in through the chat um, and both of them are kind of similar questions, but both people want to know if there's um, immunotherapy for um, ovarian cancer or if there's immunotherapy for differentiated thyroid cancer. Um, so it's a good question. So um, um, not FDA approved for either, I believe. Um, uh, definitely clinical trials in both. Um, for differentiated thyroid cancer, um, for differentiated... Hold on one second, I actually had my... Um, for differentiated thyroid cancer, uh, there's some very good targeted therapies. The molecular targeted therapies uh, have been kind of the focus, um, but, uh, but immunotherapy has been less effective for a subset for what's called anaplastic thyroid cancer. Um, immunotherapy uh, has actually had a, a pretty good effect. Um, uh, and then again, for ovarian cancer, um, I, I believe it's actually not a focus of my um, in my clinical work, but um, I believe there are some subsets where immunotherapy may be more useful, but I, I don't think yet there's yet a uh, FDA approval um, uh, for ovarian cancer. Thank you so much. Um, and then we've got um, a really good question here is, why does immunotherapy work for some cancers and not other cancers? And then uh, kind of to follow up, what is the difference between long-term remission and a cure? Yeah. Um, and then how do you decide to give one drug or a combo of drugs? So right. So those are all good questions. I'll just start with the, what's the difference between long-term remission and cure? Some of it is semantics. Remission basically means the cancer has gone away and you can't find it. Uh, or partial remission means it's better, but not gone. But complete remission means it's gone away, can't find it, and you don't know if it's going to come back or not. Um, at some point when it doesn't come back, it's probably not going to come back. It's a little hard to say with some cancers how long that is. What we've learned with most, immuno, with most cancers that have been treated with immunotherapy, if the cancer stays away for three years, completely gone, it's pretty uncommon for it to come back. So um, you can start saying cure probably with immunotherapy if the cancer has gone away and stayed away for two and a half, three years. It's a little bit of a you know, just a gradient of when do you say, you know, 95% likely cured, 98%, 99%. Um, in terms of why do some respond and why don't, some don't respond? Well, again, that's it's a huge focus of the research. Uh, we do know that the factors that predict for some cancers uh, being more likely to respond is if the cancer is inflamed, meaning it already has the immune cells in it. Um, if the cancer has more genetic abnormalities, not the genes you're born with that, that, that you inherit, but genes that have gone awry. So for example, all the skin cancers are some of the cancers that respond best to immunotherapy. And that's because sun damage is a big part of um, what causes those cancers, repetitive sun damage, lots of DNA damage. And those cancers seem to respond better to immunotherapy. Um, uh, so there's a lot of things we could talk about, but, um, but that's really the focus of uh, you know, why is that happening and what can we do to drive those cells to be more inflamed, to, to, to allow them to accept the immunotherapy or respond better to immunotherapy? And there was a third question in there, but I can't remember what that third one was. Um, the third one was, how do you decide to give one drug or a combo of drugs? Oh, so it's a good question. Uh, most of that is driven by what the clinical trials have, have told us. Um, so, immuno, so melanoma, for example, um, what the main clinical trial, and I showed it early on, um, is that, um, and I'm going to actually pull that up because I think it's a little bit instructive. Let me see if I can find it quick enough. Um, is it, uh, yeah, so here's, um, 
a, a melanoma clinical trial. Um, in this trial, people either got ipilimumab, that's the one drug, nivolumab, which is one drug, or the combination of two. Um, and um, I should show the longer term follow up, but when you look, these two lines end up separated by about six or seven percent, meaning if you give the two drugs together, you probably incure, increase the cure, cure rate by six or seven percent, which is really meaningful. You know, you treat 100 patients, and six or seven of those 100 will be cured by getting two rather than one, six or seven additional. Um, but the side effect rate goes from 20% to 50%. So if you're treating someone who's relatively frail uh, or elderly, and they may not tolerate the side effects, you're often gonna give just the one drug. There's some other markers, for example, um, that same study showed that if you have a certain genetic mutation in the tumor called a BRAF mutation, um, you really should give both drugs. You improve cure rate by about 15%, and if you don't have that mutation, it doesn't really matter if you give one or both, the cure rate's the same. So you can make some of those decisions based on the biology of the cancer and who the patient is in front of you. Uh, uh, ultimately, it's a, you know, you talk to the patient and you try to work through that decision together. Thank you, Dr. Rockstein. Um, and then can you talk about immunotherapy for pancreatic cancer? Um, the person specifically was wondering if you treat pancreatic cancer. I don't, but my colleagues do. And again, that's been one where there's been a little less, uh, there's been a lot of study, but has not been as much benefit, but there is some benefit in some cases of pancreatic cancer. So it is used at some points in pancreatic cancer. And again, especially in, in clinical trials. Thank you. And just a plug for those of you who are on call today with pancreatic cancer, we do have a a program on Wednesday with Roth Pancreatic Cancer Foundation with Dr. Talamanti. Um, so if you're interested in registering, you could go to cancerwellness.org. Uh, moving on to a couple other questions. Um, is, her is her septin considered immunotherapy even though it's uh, monoclonal antibody? Uh, so it's a great question. It helps with some definitions. So her septin, rituxin, and all of the checkpoint inhibitors, they're all monoclonal antibodies. That means they're manufactured proteins, manufactured in a certain way. Perceptin is a biologic that, that um, actually works partially through the immune system, but it's not, it's not the immunotherapy drugs we're talking about now. It's not a checkpoint inhibitor. Um, so it, it really is a, a separate class. Perceptin has been around longer than this current uh, you know, uh, cadre of immunotherapy drugs that we've been talking about. Thank you. Um, and then there's a person who mentions, also asks if immunoth immunotherapy is used to treat uh, brain cancers specifically. So that, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so again, it's, it's not FDA approved, but there are trials. So we have, for example, three clinical trials in brain cancer in various situations where people might get immunotherapy. And um, with any of the cancers that I mentioned, um, even if there's not a specific FDA approved indication, um, we'll do some genetic testing. We'll look to see if that specific cancer, even if it's for a cancer where there's not indication, if we find the specific uh, uh, tumor mutation burden, that's a, a number that looks at how abnormal the cancer cell is. If that number is greater than 10, it's FDA indicated. So any cancer could potentially be if it, if it fits the right criteria. Thank you. And this next question, actually, I've heard in other couple of programs, is the person mentioned that um, he has HPT positive cancer um, and was told that it's easier to treat with standard chemotherapy. Um, does that mean that immunotherapy is not the first choice? Uh, so it's a good question. So um, <clears throat> if it hasn't spread, then immunotherapy at this point is not a standard way to treat it. Uh, we use either surgery or radiation or radiation and chemotherapy. Radiation and chemotherapy is the most common. And that's the standard way and the best way. There are clinical trials. We participate in a couple of those, uh, looking to see if the use of immunotherapy at the beginning uh, of treatment uh, may make the treatment either easier, meaning allowing you to drop the chemotherapy uh, or better. Uh, but that's, that's not as, uh, yet an FDA standard uh, way to treat it. Um, but if uh, an HPV head and neck cancer spreads, if it shows up in other parts of the body, 
and uh, can't be removed or shouldn't be removed. Um, then we use immunotherapy uh, in the first line, meaning we uh, don't give chemotherapy. We start with immunotherapy in most situations. We certain things we have to measure, but we usually do. Thank you. Um, and then this is a little bit more specific. Um, the person notes that immunotherapy will not contain his T cell um, NHL permanently and will be getting bromtoxamib. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing that one. Is that a, a standard? Uh, if you can read it again, because there, there was kind of a, I, I didn't know if there was going to be another part of the question. So if you could read it again, I'll try to do my best to answer that one. Um, so the person is wondering um, why immunotherapy cannot contain his, cannot contain the T cell NHL permanently. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I, I think maybe, so maybe I guess the question is, well, if, if the T cells are the fundamental part of how these treatments work, why is it not uh, able to uh, treat a T cell lymphoma? Um, in that situation, the T cell lymphoma, those cells are tumor cells and they can evade the immune system in the same way that, you know, a melanoma cell can or a pancreatic cancer cell can. Um, so these types of uh, immune therapies, the checkpoint inhibitor therapies, um, haven't worked as well against the lymphomas. There actually is approval for certain lymphomas like uh, certain Hodgkin's lymphomas. Um, but some of the other T, uh, immunotherapies, for example, the CAR T cell therapies are really uh, exclusively working for the lymphomas or leukemias, whereas the regular solid tumors so far are not um, treated very well by CAR T cell therapy. Um, so it really just gets at some of the biological characteristics of specific cancers. Thank you, Dr. Roxy. Um, on the similar but to bladder cancer, are you familiar with BCG treatments for bladder cancer? And if so, can you explain how, um, how does it work to attach, attack the cancer? I think the person is asking. Yeah, so BCG, uh, or Basile Camille Giret is uh, exactly, this was, uh, um, it's a nonspecific treatment. It's an organism that's actually like tuberculosis, but it's a benign form of it. Um, and it um, is instilled into the bladder um, and it's an irritant. So it basically causes a nonspecific inflammation in the bladder. And so that really get, this was one of the precursor treatments that actually um, made people recognize that the immune system can treat cancer you put in this foreign substance into the bladder and it creates this inflammation uh, that eradicates uh, what's called superficial bladder cancer, bladder cancer that's just sitting on the inner surface of the bladder, not deep into it. Um, so it basically works by uh, being recognized by, uh, uh, by the internal immune system of the bladder causing inflammation and that inflammation um, eradicates this, the surface cancer cells.